Rabar Mas. You're only just four in the first year. Eh? Who's that? Uh, what has happened to him? Uh, I see. But he's not here today. Anyway. If you got a grasp of what is meant by hermeneutics, not yet. Let me start from a different point of view. How do we know? And how do we know that what we know is true? Two questions. How do we know? And how do we know that what we know is true? Those are two different questions. How do we know? <laughs> there are two basic lines on in answering that question. One is the answer given by Plato. Plato says that all knowledge is already in your mind. So that if somebody says to you that's a chair. And you see the chair, immediately the idea of a chair in the abstract is already in your mind. Therefore, you can understand when somebody says to you, that is a chair. Yes, I know what a chair means. Because in my mind there is something called a chair. Now this is not accepted by everyone. Come. Close that door. Not everybody accepts this view of Plato that all knowledge is simply remembering what we already know. That is, in previous births all this knowledge has already come into our consciousness that uh, the ideas are innate. Innate means born with. In means in. Nate means born. Inborn. When you are born already, you carry with you all the experiences of previous births. This is Plato's theory. That knowledge is simply recapitulation. Knowledge is remembering. Everything is already in your mind, you only bring it out little by little. Now, Plato's view is questioned by many people for many counts. If you say that all knowledge is in your mind and that it is gathered by previous births, then among the previous births there was a first birth. Uh, in that first birth how do you know? When you had no previous birth. Do you understand the problem? If you say that knowledge is only a recapitulation of what is already in your mind and what is already in your mind comes from previous births if the previous births are a finite series, the first of these births, how did you know? Couldn't have been by the same way. Couldn't have been remembering. You see the problem? 
പക്ഷേ മലയാളം കഴിഞ്ഞ ജന്മങ്ങളിൽ ഉണ്ടായ അനുഭവങ്ങളുടെ ഫലമായിട്ട് മനസ്സിലുള്ള അറിവ് കൊണ്ട് ആണ് ഇപ്പോൾ അറിയുന്നത് എങ്കിൽ ആ ജന്മങ്ങൾ ഒരു ഫൈനൈറ്റ് സീരീസ് ആയതുകൊണ്ട് അതിനൊരു നമ്പർ വൺ ബർത്ത് മസ്റ്റ് ബി എ നമ്പർ വൺ ബർത്ത് ഇൻ ദാറ്റ് നമ്പർ വൺ ബർത്ത് യു കുഡ് റിമെമ്പർ ഫ്രം പ്രീവിയസ് ബർത്ത്സ് ഇൻകൺസിസ്റ്റന്റ് പ്ലേറ്റോസ് തിയറി ഈസ് ഇൻകൺസിസ്റ്റന്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ബേസ്ഡ് ഓൺ ദി ഐഡിയ ദാറ്റ് there are some things with which we are born that's one idea the other idea is that we are born with a clean slate that our mind is a clean slate a clean blackboard tabula rasa rasa means erased and tabula means usually blackboard erased blackboard so that is what you start with and then every experience brings to you something new and how do you know they say through the senses and what are the senses they think the senses are something like cameras the eye is a camera eh the eye goes and takes photographs and gets some impressions on a film behind somewhere or on a tv screen somewhere and it projects itself it doesn't work it does i don't think it can be proved that that is the way we know the only distinctive and clear principle laid down was by Immanuel Kant who said that the senses are receiving sense data rather passively avarku onnum cheyanilla they don't have to do anything the sense data will just keep coming in through these windows the senses are windows of the soul and through those windows a lot of data is coming in and then there is something called the mind which is different from the senses and this mind simply acts as a shaping instrument because as the data come through the senses the mind gathers them together and puts it into its categories what are the categories well time space at this time at this point in space large small quantity quality relationship all these things are supplied by the mind for example let me ask you the question this paper weight is different from this book agree the paper weight exists objectively the book exists objectively but difference does it objectively exist difference between this and this does it exist objectively there is a sense of comparison ah only in relation to the two you can say they are different but difference itself is not an objective thing in the world but a thing which our mind supplies that these are not the same thing that not sameness may or may not exist that difference may or may not exist but it is our experience and that is the way our mind functions so the mind imposes certain categories on the object of the senses and this is the general theory of immanuel kant but he also recognized that that theory is full of problems for example we take something called 
quantity. When we think about quantity, we know of something called infinity. In quantity there is something called infinity. But do we objectively see infinity? Do we? Do we objectively see infinity? Can infinity be objectified? What is infinity? Means it has no fin, no end, no boundary. If it has no boundary, how can we see it? Because we always have boundaries for our perceptions. So the question of what is a finite entity and what is an infinite entity is itself problematic, anomalous. The question of quantity creates difficulties for conceptual understanding. This can be said about space, about time. If you say space, where does it end? If it ends, what is beyond space? If space is finite, there must be something beyond space. Le. Is space finite? What is your idea? How do you solve that problem? Is space finite? Space is infinite. What is relative? Because it depends on my, my perception. Yeah. So you think space actually exists objectively? I think it is an existential uh, uh, reality, but it's existential because uh, I, 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 at the same time, not because, at the same time, for in the other, um, one may think of all the qualities being taken away but the space. The space cannot be thought not existing. But the whole space, the individual spaces are consisting within the total uh, space and like that. So one cannot think of different spaces and only one space. And <laughs> And that space objectively exists. Yeah, or is it there? Uh, what do you mean by relative? What do you mean by existential? According to Kant, space is one of the modalities of perception. Human beings see everything in terms of space. But that is the way our mind is structured. This doesn't guarantee that something called space exists out there which is independent of our perception. Apart from our perception, we don't know what space really is. But our mind is such that we see things extended in space. There is a here and a there. And there is a distance in between here and there. That is the way our minds perceive. But whether that space objectively exists, we have no way of finding out. Because only if there is another mind, can it find out in that mind will have its own categories. So the objectivity of nothing is really given. What about time? We have taken that question up before. Time, does it, is it finite or is it infinite? First question, what is the answer? Is time infinite or is it finite? Infinite. Huh? Infinite. infinite. Infinity of time presupposes that time exists and all the other things are inside time. 
That's the way we all think. The creation occurred so many thousands of years ago and time exists and inside time something called creation occurred. That's the way quite often even our biblical fundamentalists would say that is what happened. But then the question is raised, what was happening before the creation was created? You know Luther's famous answer. Luther was asked that question, Martin Luther. What was God doing before He created the world? The answer was, He was running around in the forest, cutting little sticks to beat up little boys who asked naughty questions. Because <laughs> He couldn't answer that question. It's a good question. What was God doing before time? Well, the Hindus asked me that question. You say God is a creator, that there is a possibility of a creator who had not created and at the moment of his creating he changed from a God without creation to a God with creation. That means he must have changed at the time of creation. What is the answer to that philosophically? Philosophically we all say in our Christian tradition at least, that time has a beginning. Time is not infinite. Time begins with the beginning of creation. There is no time before creation. Time is itself an aspect of creation. In creation everything is extended in time and space. But in God there is no before and after, no here and there. There is no dimension to God. That doesn't mean that He is a point. But He is not, God is not extended in time and space. Difficult. Eh? Before creation, there, was no there was no nothing before creation. Creation is the beginning of creation. And time and space and everything begins only with creation. And there is no question of before that. God is God. In Him there is neither before nor after. All things are co-present to Him. All time is co-present to Him. And for Him there is no today and no tomorrow. It's only for us these three basic distinctions of time belong to our perception. What is that? Three basic perceptions? Today, yesterday and tomorrow. These are all three basic perceptions, past, present and future. And for us we are fleeting within time in such a way that what is present the moment you say it becomes part of the past. It's constantly flowing. Time is flowing from the future into the past and we are at the point of intersection between the future and the past which we call present. But this is a particular creation of our mind. There is no before and after and so on, yes, past, present and future for God. For God, what is future for us is already present for Him from the beginning. The simplest analogy that I use is that of an ant moving along a pencil line. Hmm? For the ant, all it sees is a series of points of lead. Everything is lead points. And in it, the ant leaves some behind and some are still in front as it goes. But you can see the whole line from beginning to end and the ant marching on it. For you, the line is a single entity totally present to you. What is future for the ant is present for you. This is an analogy. Hmm? So it's just to give you an idea 
of how God's perception is not exactly the same as the perception of people who are living in time. God is not living in time. And in God there is no time-space extension. That belongs only to our experience. But the whole of time and the whole of space, whether it's finite or infinite, and for, for Christian teaching, both time and space are finite. They are not infinite. For modern physics, what is the situation in relation to space? Space is finite but expanding. That is modern physics. Modern physics says it's like a balloon expanding balloon. It is finite, but you can never reach the boundary of it because even at the boundary it's constantly growing. Space is an expanding universe, but it's finite. And for modern physics, the question whether the universe had a beginning or not, and how it began cannot be scientifically answered. There can be only speculation. Sometimes it looks like they are saying science. It's not science. For example, The History of Time, the book, have you read that? Paperback book by Stephen Hawking called History of Time. He tries to tell you how time began and all that, but it's not science. It's only because he has done, used our little knowledge, and then projects it back to the forefront and tries to make a theory. But science has no way of testing its theory, whether it's true or not. The question philosophically became rather clear with René Descartes, you know that name, D-E-S-C-A-R-T-E-S. -E How do you pronounce that? De, no, 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 no. Descartes. Descartes. Descartes, Allah. Descartes. Descartes. Not Cartes. Descartes. Descartes was a man who had a good mind. One day he was sitting and uh, on a cold winter day he was uh, sitting in a room with a fire going and felt good. And then he began thinking. And he said, well, I want to understand reality. So I must begin somewhere where the first point must be undoubtable. The first point of my thinking must be something which I cannot doubt. And you know what the first point was. What was it? I think, therefore I am. I must exist because I am the one who is doing the thinking. And if the thinker does not exist, how can he think? So one thing is sure, that I exist. Now you know where Descartes got that idea. He got it from St. Augustine, where it was a better idea than his. St. Augustine also tried to think like this, and in his time there was something called skepticism. You've heard about skepticism. Skepticism is the capacity to doubt and disprove everything. So almost everything was disputed in skepticism. And Augustine was a child who came out of that kind of world and therefore Augustine said, I doubt everything, I don't know anything, nothing is sure, one thing is sure, I doubt. Therefore, I am. I think he did not say. I doubt. 
Therefore, the one who doubts must exist. Ah, yes, Descartes learned Augustine because he was studying with the Jesuits. He studied Augustine and Augustine he got this idea and made it, I think, therefore I am. Augustine was much more uh, interesting. I doubt. Everything is uncertain. Only my doubt is certain. <laughs> See, for example, if you say everything is changing, what is it that does not change? Change. If everything is changing, change is change, always there, isn't it? If everything is changing, that which does not change is change. Same kind of logic. If everything I doubt, then the only thing I am sure about is that I doubt. That's the only thing I am sure of. Eh? Ah, the activity of doubting is the only certain thing. Everything I try to say can be disproved. Therefore, the only certainty is that of doubt and therefore the doubter must be there. Now Descartes changed that and said, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. I exist. Now in saying that, Descartes was facing a problem. Usually, there are only three realities, which is the self, the world, God. The self, the world, and God. Now the existence of God has been debated by people, so we don't know for sure. And the existence of the world is also debated. So you can't start your thinking in anywhere in the world because nothing in the world is certain. The only thing that is certain then left is myself and my ego. Now this is a, an assumption which has been questioned in subsequent days. How do you know that you think? Who is it that knows that I think? I think, therefore I am. But the whole history of the Western thinking is they have been trying to find a place that can be absolutely grasped either in objective reality, they can't find it in objective reality, they'll go back to the subjective and say the subjective is real. This is exactly what Descartes did. He divided all reality into two categories. What are the categories? One he called res extensa, R-E-S, res extensa, that means extended reality. Res means thing or reality. Extended reality is one thing, which you see, chairs, tables, everything is extended in time and space. Eh? That is res extensa, that is one world what we today call the objective world. And there is another world which is res cogitans, R-E-S-C-O-G-I-T-A-N-S. What is res cogitans? The thinking thing. The thinking thing is one thing and the extended thing is another thing. He divided all of reality into those two realities. Res extensa and res cogitans. Res which things, and that is why he thinking self. Now the West has been moving between these two. Either the objective reality, grasp it in a very strong way, or the subjective reality which we call consciousness. Consciousness and the world are the two things into which Descartes and Western thinking as a whole have divided into, divided reality into. 
Now let me ask the question. Is the res cogitans a res extensa? Yes, it exists ah. in space and time. Ah. So that itself is a uh, res extensa, part of res extensa. He divides into two pieces, res cogitans, res extensa, but he did not see that the res cogitans is also a res extensa. Because there is no mind which is not attached to your body. That he didn't see. He simply divided the two and said these are two totally different worlds and must be known differently. So his basic error he said in that division. He did not take the res cogitans as part of the res extensor. He thought it was something apart from can you as a human being, stand outside the universe and think it, objectifying it. Can you st- is there a place where you can stand outside the universe and look at the world? No. Every time you look at the world, you are an integral part of that world which you are looking at. The subjective reality is an integral part of the objective world which you are trying to understand. Now, today this has become more obvious in nuclear physics that all perception includes the subject in its perception. That is to say, in micro reality, that is sub atomic reality. How can you know particles? Well, I think today's paper or yesterday's paper was saying something about the last quark having been discovered by a scientific team which includes an Indian scientist. Oh, wonderful! You think they actually saw the last quark? I said, it's a strange kind of quark quark which is very bright and heavy and it has the same weight as the atom of gold. But it is part of every atom. It's not a very thing that you have seen objective. How can you photograph even a particle? Never mind the quark. Each Each particle is supposed to be composed of six different quarks. You can't even photograph a particle. Why? How do you photograph? You send a ray of light on the object and the ray of light is reflected onto a film. Now a particle is already a moving reality. It's not a stationary reality. And if you hit it with a ray of light, even one single photon, it will go the other way. Because when something is moving, you go and hit it with a ray of light, it won't just send a reflection, it will be deflected. You have to add some energy to the particle in order to photograph it. By that time the particle is no longer the particle. It is the confluence of your measuring particle and the particle together. So there is no way of measuring these things, no way of objectifying this. And quark is only a theory. Nobody has seen a quark and nobody has seen a particle either, either with naked eyes or by photographic equipment. One theory was that, well, the only thing you can do is that if you want to photograph the sun, you don't need a ray of light to go on the sun and come back. If you open your camera to the sun, the sun's rays itself will make an impression, isn't it? You don't have to send another ray of light. Even if it's in the dark, the sun will have its own light. Like that, the particle has its own light. And that will make an impression on the film. That's what they are trying to do now in nuclear research. You know what a particle accelerator is? What they are trying to do is, they are trying to shoot particles through a tunnel. 
have particles travel at the speed of light. So if you send a ray of light after it, you won't be able to chase it. It will go away. But supposing when what you can do is, you make a tunnel, all coated with photographic film, okay? so that if the particle goes through that tunnel, it must send a it must be traced by the film. The film will automatically record it without our having to send a ray of light to photograph it. By its own light, it can be photographed so long as the particle is not exposed to the outside world but kept inside a tunnel. So what they have constructed in Geneva is a seven kilometer long tunnel. Imagine seven kilometers long tunnel how huge, underground, huge tunnel, tunnel about uh, fourteen feet or so diameter. Hmm? And through that they are sending these particles and they think that whatever line appears on the film, they can't see the particle going, whatever see you see on the film must be the trajectory of the particle and they are trying to shoot millions of particles take all their trajectories, see if there is any law which governs these trajectories. So far it's very difficult. Generally speaking, the assumption is that the movement of a particle, when it is observed and measured, becomes changed by the attempt to perceive it. A particle, every time you measure it, undergoes a change. Let me try to say it a little more simply. In our world, there is one thing called light, which we know. Light is composed of what? Particles or waves? Photons. Eh? Photons. Photons. Are they particles or waves? Waves. Ah. No, particles which travel in waves. <laughs> Not particles which travel in waves, but they are particle waves. Or some people now call them wavicles. Because in some measurements they behave like particles, in some measurements they behave like waves. That doesn't mean that they are either wave or particle, but because if we want to understand, the two things we understand are waves because we have seen waves in the ocean. And so we are trying to understand things on the analogy of something of our ordinary experience. But sometimes it doesn't behave like waves, it behaves some like a ray of particles. Now, therefore, we have now said that photons are corpuscular undulatory. That is the adjective in science now. Corpuscular means particles. Undulatory means waves. They are both at the same time, and sometimes you can measure them as particles and sometimes as waves. How many of you have heard about the two-slit experiment? One of the experiments that they have tried with particles is that, you know what a particle generator is, a, an electronic gun which shoots particles and in a closed space. Eh? And there is a screen there with a hole A, which is, say, rectangular, another hole B, which is circular. Supposing we shoot particles from here, there is a screen behind that where all the records are made, all the impacts are made. If you shoot some rays through this, what will happen to those rays? Some of them will pass through the rectangular hole, some of them will pass through the circular hole. So every time you shoot, more or less the same impression should be made on the screen behind it. So you try another way. 
Supposing you close the, la- the hole A and shoot particles, then they will have to go through hole B only. Eh? I will make an impression. Then you close B and then send it through A. It will be a different pattern on the screen, not exactly the same as B. So if you take both are open and then you shoot, the resulting pattern must be a function of A and B. Function of A and B means it must be compatible, it must be measurable in terms of partly A and partly B. It is not. Not only that, every time you shoot, there is a different design. The design is not consistent. So you decide, okay, these particles are cheating us. So by each hole you put a device to measure the way the particle is going. Then the particles behave very much like particles. The moment you measure, the wave function collapses and only the particle function remains. But the moment you take the measuring instrument away, goes back to the old wayward way. When you measure it, it obeys your rules. If you don't measure it, it doesn't obey your rules. This is what is called the two-slit experiment. And it's now generally acknowledged that particles have no predetermined path unless you measure them. When you put a measuring instrument on them, you reduce them to space and time then they behave according to space-time rules. But you take the measuring instrument away, they behave randomly. So, we have now come to the conclusion that by the moment you measure something, you have imposed your own mind and measuring instruments on reality and thereby shaped reality to be something else than what it really is. This is modern physics. And so today everybody would say that human beings, even by the most sophisticated instruments, cannot see reality as it is. Now you see, if you really look at that, it's the old doctrine of Maya. The reality which you perceive is not really there. It is a projection of two things. According to Shankara's Vedanta, Shankara's Mayavada, it's a kind of magician's trick. God, Brahma is a magician. He's playing certain tricks and showing you certain things which you see. But those are not there. They are only the magician's creation. That's what really Maya means. Maya means Brahma is projecting a reality just like a magician is projecting his realities. And our avidya mind adds to that projection something and what we get is this kind of world. This is Shankara's interpretation of what we perceive is. Even before Shankara, Nagarjuna had another explanation which Shankara took and slightly modified. What does that say? Is the world of our experience real? What's his answer of Nagarjuna? If you ask him if the world real, Shankara would say, Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahmaiva Na Para. That is, the Jiva is only Brahma and the Jagat is Mithya, vanity. That's Shankara's answer. Nagarjuna wouldn't say that. Nagarjuna in the first century would not agree with that. Eight hundred years before Shankara, he would say, if you say that this world is unreal, you're talking about something which you don't know, as if you know what is real. What will be real if you want to make it real? It's only a conception that you are throwing from your mind, saying that something real and something unreal exists. Does the unreal exist? How can the unreal exist? 
So Nagarjuna says, don't say it's not true, don't say it's false, don't say it's true and false, don't say it's partly true and partly false, whatever you say everything will be wrong. All you can say is, when our kind of mind exposes itself to this kind of world, this kind of a world emerges. That's all you can say. This is great wisdom. Already in the first century India produced this wisdom and modern science says nothing more than that. Namely, that the world of our experience is a joint product of our perception and whatever is there. And that is now generally accepted also in Western philosophy, that all perceived worlds are joint products of the perceiving mind and whatever world there is. The world as it is we can never know. We know only the world as we perceive it. That's all we can know. We cannot know the world in itself. This Immanuel Kant also saw. And so he said, the thing in itself is not knowable. Only the thing as it appears to us. And what is the word for appears? As it appears, what is the word? Phenomenon. Phenomenon means phenomena, that which shines forth. Only the appearance we can perceive, not the reality behind the appearance. This was recognized as early as Immanuel Kant in Western thought. So, Descartes' assumption that there is something called an objective world, and there is something else called a subjective world, doesn't work. The so-called objective world is a product of the subjective mind. It doesn't exist independently of the subjective mind. Do you follow that point? Do you get that point? The so-called objective world is the product of human subjectivity interacting with whatever there is. Now, what there is we can't know. We can only know how our subjectivity perceives it. That's all we can know. You follow that point? So the attempt to find an objective world that is independent of our subjective mind doesn't work. Now what can hermeneutics do in that situation? Hermeneutics applies <coughs> applies the critical principle to what we seem to know. That is, if somebody says that a chair is a four-legged thing with a seat and a backrest, well, that is the def definition given to us. You must examine that. Is that true? Supposing the chair has only three legs, it would still be a chair, wouldn't it? So, you can criticize. Already your knowledge is given that a chair is something with four legs back, a seat and a backrest. But then you can question that definition in the light of it. That is critical interpretation. That is all that hermeneutics does. Hermeneutics da takes what is given by the tradition and then applies the critical mind to it. This is the basic principle of hermeneutics. Now the Cartesian separation of the world into subjective and objective made the West think that they could know the world objectively. And the whole project of modern science is to know the world objectively. 
but it has fallen flat. Since 1970, nobody would say that science knows things as they are. Previously the claim was that in science we know things as they are. No. In science we know things as they appear to us. That's all. We don't know them as they are. Now, hermeneutics is partly the recognition of that, that subjectivity is an essential part of all knowledge. Now, another fundamental point, I don't know if you can grasp it, When you say objective world, you think of space in which things exist, perhaps in relation to each other, but space in which things exist. Space is your basic framework for the objective world. This is a static view, that there is space and things in space. How can we make it dynamic? Only by bringing time as a dimension of space. When time comes, it's no longer things in space, but events in time-space, which is different. Another way of seeing the world is not as space in which things are arranged, but as time-space within which the basic constituent is an event. And in that event, of course, there are things, persons, actions and so on, but the event is this single constituent element and this kind of world view was uh, initiated in Western world by Wilhelm Diltai. Have you ever heard about his name? Diltai, how do you spell Diltai? I hear when I go to Trivandrum, all these professors say Dilti, and I get so mad. D I L T H E Y. It's not Dilti, but Diltai. That's the German pronunciation of D I L T H E Y. Diltai. Diltai started the idea which was later further developed by the other great German thinker whose name is Husserl, H-U-S-S-E-R-L. Now Diltai said the whole problem with human knowledge is because we are using science as the basic category of knowing. And in science we think of things in space. But if we think history is the real framework for reality, not a standing still world, not a static world, but a moving world, which is history. History includes space and things in space, but includes more. It includes things which happen to things. And Hedeltai in the 19th century made historical knowledge the foundation of knowledge. And my goodness, how did it touch our theology? All theology changed. History became the central point in theology. What history? Salvation history. And everything was history. Nineteenth century German theology, always history. Before that you won't find history. In the Bible you won't find a word for history. But because Diltai established that the historical method is superior to the scientific method, and that is the best way of knowing reality, so the theologians immediately switched on to historische or geschichtliche 
and the history of salvation movement all that came to be and the historical jesus came to be all this historical business came because in secular philosophy they made a shift from the physics view to the history view of the world that was when all our theology went haywire and we all started a new theology all history everywhere history history is history, history historical jesus the story of salvation and until the women said stop it it's not his story it's her story as well <laughs> anyway this leben's world as it was called by husser husser called it leben's world leben means what in german leben means life leben's world is life world it's a different world from the world of objects the physical science studies the world of objects history studies the world of events leben's world life world and even our world in consciousness is not a static thing our consciousness also is a moving thing isn't it the mind doesn't stay still the mind also moves and so you came to have thinking about the stream of consciousness you don't speak of consciousness as a camera but it's a moving thing and in literature everybody brought it up stream of consciousness literary devices began each person sitting and simply cop count recounting what is going on in his mind just say ah what is his name joyce who wrote ulysses and all that are all literary writers took to this kind of stream of consciousness this is how western thinking moves every time there is in philosophy a new insight immediately it's reflected in theology and in philosophy and uh, that's what has been happening but the world of consciousness is a world in which there is also various mutual relations inside consciousness each idea in the mind is not remaining totally distinct and unrelated to other ideas all the ideas in consciousness are also interacting so cartesianisms non subjective objectivity you know you know what cartesianism means that which follows the line of descartes is called cartesianism now descartes was trying to get a non subjective objectivity you know what because their perception was the objective world cannot make a mistake mistakes are made by the subjective world do you agree the machine doesn't make a mistake only people make mistakes therefore the source of all error is the subjective eliminate the subjective you will get pure truth this is the idea whether it's true or not now we know it doesn't work the subjective was regarded as the source of error the source of truth isn't it error is only one aspect of it but you can't eliminate the subjective and then no truth because man is by nature subjective subjectivity is an essential aspect of the human and all knowing includes subjective equipment and therefore you cannot have a non subjective objectivity that project has now been abandoned 
But that's what science was claiming to be. Science was claiming to be non-subjective objectivity. Well, I must say that I have attacked this view of science for the last 30-40 years at the risk of great unpopularity among scientists and philosophers of science. But now it is accepted by everybody. Now all the philosophers know that without subjectivity there is no world. World itself requires subjectivity. It's only by subjectivity that the world arises. And subjectivity is the most important part of the human. Not only the source of error, but also the source of truth as far as a human being is concerned. Where else will we know the truth if we don't have the subjective? Do we have something called the objective somewhere in our brain by which we can know? No. It's only by the subjective that we know. This is now recognized that the subjectivity is the essential aspect of all knowledge. And so science has now abandoned its claim. My making fun of science started with accusing it of naive realism. What is naive realism? The belief that things are what they seem to be. Things are what they appear to be. As a chair, as a chair, the chair exists. And that is the reality of the chair. That's naive. That is unreflected realism. To think that things are as they are, things in themselves and things as we perceive are the same. This naive realism is now abandoned. Science's claim is now dynamited to know things as they are. So when we had a seminar last year at Delhi University, we had professors from various countries come. They made this claim that science no longer makes the claim that it knows things as they are. In fact, and this is the shocking thing, science no longer claims to be knowledge. Can you imagine that? Philosophers of science from the University of Vienna, University of Cambridge, and University of Harvard, and other universities in America coming together and saying, science is not knowledge. In the sense of knowing the truth. Science is only operational knowledge. And they gave it a new name because they can no longer stand on naive realism. They said, this is constructive realism. What is constructive realism? A real world which we construct with our mind. That is what they call constructive realism. They no longer say the world exists as we, as it is, or that science can know the world as it is, but that we with our minds construct a world in which we see some regularities which we study in science and because we study these regularities we can manipulate reality. We can make it operate according to our purposes. So it is called constructive realism instead of naive realism. In any case, hermeneutics is the recognition that the subjective is an essential part of all knowledge. Now, hermeneutics also says that science has abandoned reflection and only tries to describe reality. It doesn't reflect about the meaning of what you observe, but only 
describes what is observed. This is not enough. So we have to go beyond the positivism, beyond science. But how do we know it? Science, we think we know what it is. But if science is not the only thing, how do we know? What else do we have for knowing? Well, give me some examples of knowing outside of science. Take simple thing, knowing human beings. Is that by science that we know human beings? Science is not certainly the criterion for knowing human beings. Human relationships, which are so important in our existence, science doesn't say much about it. Innate. Eh? Innate concepts. Innate, innate concepts. or not, we will wait till some time. We only will say that some of the most important things in life cannot be known by science. And the fact that I love my mother is a very important fact. And science has no way of simply studying that and giving me an objective version of what actually happens. And therefore, in the modern day, we accept other forms of knowing and expressing. What are they? We call them symbol systems of which language is one symbol system because language means what is written language written language is mostly ink on paper that's not reality it's only ink isn't it it's not reality this is not reality a map that's not reality if you have a map of Kotem you can't say this is Kotem no what is printed on paper or what is even spoken of is not the reality. Its language is one symbol system by which a community has agreed. This word man means this. This word cow means this. In each language there is a separate agreement. Isn't it? What English says is man, Malayalam would say manishan or something else. So it's a language is a locally agreed upon convention among people. Language doesn't give you the truth as it is. Language is made of either sounds or ink on paper, printed or written. That is only a sign, a symbol. A symbol which points to something beyond itself. Reality is not right in the language itself, but it is one way of dealing with reality. The other symbol systems there are three which are fundamental. Art, philosophy, religion. Art, philosophy, religion. These are three of the common symbol systems of a community. What we perceive, we express through art, or through music, or through sculpture, or through dance, all of that is art. Philosophy is again using language, but it is asking questions about the ultimate nature of reality. And religion is also a set of symbols through which we express what reality is. So, the idea that science is the only way to express reality or to know reality is no longer valid. And therefore, the idea of consciousness is also changing. Previously, we thought consciousness was composed of ideas. The mind is composed of ideas. Why did we think like that? Because that was thought of by professors who have only ideas to deal with. And so they were talking about the mind as composed of ideas. 
the new thinking is different. You know what has happened in psychology? Well, till about 15 years ago, mind was measured through things called IQ. Huh? And everybody was labeled, he has got 124, this fellow has only 78, and all that. Rubbish! Those are all subjective criteria by which some people put some tests and found out some answers. The mind is not something which you can measure by IQ. It was then came to the other psychology of Piaget. Never heard about him. P-I-A-G-E-T. Piaget. It's a very important name, so you better write it down. Piaget gave us a new understanding of the human mind. The human mind is not born as a tabula rasa. The human mind, through its experience, learns things, but the mind has inherent in its structure the capacity to learn. That's the important thing. Child, baby just born. You are talking about ideas in the baby's mind? Nothing. No ideas. There are some dreams and some fantasies and some uh, feelings and emotions and not ideas. Ideas come only about the age of three. By the time the child learns to speak a language, ideas come. Ideas are a product of language. And even in our mind, these ideas come only as we become linguistic beings. So, some years ago, there was a study by a psychologist called Goldman, who analyzed the brains of people who are dead. And... uh, he found out that the brain surface of a human being is full of squiggles, eh? little squiggles, writings. I think not what we can read, but lines of various kinds. But there's a basic distinction between two sets of lines. The lines that were formed before the child was three are totally different from the lines which were formed after the child was three. Because from three on, your experience itself becomes linguistic. I like this tea, or I like my uh, caramel, mutai. The child begins to say these things and conceptualize. Before that also it enjoyed good milk or ice cream or whatever it is, but it could not conceptualize its experience. Only after three the child begins to conceptualize experience, and in the brain there are two different kinds of squiggles. And Goldman's study was the basic foundation of personality is formed before the age of three. Because the squiggles formed when you are in the pre-linguistic stage cannot be easily changed by linguistic means. Whereas the squiggles produced by conceptual linguistic experience can be changed by further linguistic training. You can change that part of the brain But the foundational part, which is already formed by the time you are three, is very difficult to change. Not unchangeable, but it's very difficult to change because it's not conceptually received ideas, but ideas imbibed. You don't call it intuition because these are words which simply cover up our ignorance. We don't know what it means. Is there a given infrastructure of mind? Not as infrastructure but a capacity to create a structure. The mind is inherently capable because if you take a a bit of wax and expose it to ideas, it will never pick it up. eh? The mind has a capacity to pick up ideas from experience and then shape them into a world. And the world of the post-linguistic child is not the world of the pre-linguistic child. What Piaget did was, he made experiments. 
he made experiments to understand from within how a child sees reality then he began charting how the 3 year old child sees the world how the 4 year old sees the world how the 5 year old sees the world how the 12 year old world sees so what we now have as the world has been developed in the process of the shaping of our mind our mind itself has been growing and in that process our world also has been changed as our mind grows the world changes this is a very primary discovery of piaget and piaget did a lot of very important work he was living in geneva he was our neighbor he died only recently he was still there when i left geneva but piaget is now being taught in all schools and be at colleges and so on everywhere P- piaget is the rage everybody talks piaget p i a g e t pronounced yeah. not piaget but <laughs> piaget the swiss french speaking swiss but that is changed now from the iq to piaget was already a change of understanding the mind the developmental psychology it was called piaget psychology is called developmental psychology that the mind does not become born and remain the same it develops it develops through experience cultural contact that is the developmental concept of psychology that also is going out now the latest concept of psychology comes from the harvard university and you must have some idea of what the new theory is saying about the nature of the mind id ego super ego everything is gone that was freud's structure of the mind that also nobody really talks about it. it's finished that is not the way to understand the mind that the mind is three departments one called id and one called ego they call super ego no that is not the way h a r v a r d is called harvard Harvard University has now developed the theory of MI multiple intelligences multiple intelligences that means not all intelligence is of the same kind each person has more than one kind of intelligence for example i may have a little bit of the verbal intelligence eh yeah? conceptual verbal a little bit i have developed my verbal intelligence has been developed by my training but what about my artistic intelligence capacity to draw or paint total zero on one part of my intelligence has developed namely linguistic conceptual has developed but my artistic intelligence has not developed not that it i have not endowed with it but my development did not include the training of that kind of intelligence and so that remains undeveloped and the third kind of intelligence which you call human relation intelligence how to relate to other human beings that is not the same as linguistic conceptual intelligence but the capacity to deal with other human beings to behave with them to deal with them to be friendly with them to be service minded that's another kind of intelligence among the multiple intelligences the linguistic conceptual is only one the artistic intelligence the musical intelligence it's a very special kind of intelligence to understand music and to create music and to produce music that also is intelligence in some people one is very highly developed the others are not developed all of us therefore have not just one iq which can be measured by a single test but we have multiple intelligences which are at different levels of development you can have a surgical intelligence the surgeon has certain skills which belongs to his intelligence 
which he has trained and developed. Somebody else may not have that intelligence. So intelligence is not a monolithic entity. Consciousness is not a single monolithic entity, but it can have many, many aspects and many possibilities. And when we speak about consciousness, we should not think of consciousness as composed of ideas. Ideas are only one part of mind. There is art, music, literature, culture, dance. These are all different intelligence, skills, technical skills. So all these are intelligent. Technical intelligence is different from linguistic intelligence. I can't handle a computer. My technical intelligence is very undeveloped. So, each person has a multiple complex of intelligences and that's the first thing we have to learn. That intelligence is not a monolithic entity, that consciousness is not a monolithic entity. The second thing we learn is that not all of it is genetically determined. Part of it is genetically determined, part of it is culturally determined. Culturally includes cultivation. Culturally means, for example, we are growing up in the family of a great artist or a great musician. Who are the great musicians? Beethoven. Eh? Beethoven. P? Beethoven. Beethoven. Speak of some Indian musician. I just think of an Indian. Who is the case? Do you want to say Beethoven? Say Beethoven. Beit. Doesn't exist in English. Che. Beethoven. Anyway, who is the Indian musician? Pandit Ah, Pandit Ravi Shankar. Take. If you grow up in the family of Ravi Shankar, the family culture will make you a musician, wouldn't it? It's a cultural impact. It's not the children of Ravi Shankar would have both a genetic inheritance which helps them to be good musicians, but also a cultural ambience which helps them to become good musicians. So genes and culture are both factors affecting the development of consciousness. And skills, how are they acquired? Are you born with certain skills? The skill to drive a car, how do you acquire it? By training, by experience. You can't teach somebody how to swim by giving him a textbook on swimming. Can you? Would somebody learn sitting in a in a room on a chair and learn to swim by reading all the books about swimming? No, you have to dump him into the water. Actual experience, actual interaction with other human beings, actual interaction with things, this is necessary for the development of our mind. Our mind is not independent of things. It requires material reality not only as its base, because without the brain as a base, the consciousness doesn't exist as far as we know. But for its development also it has to interact with the material world. Interacting with the material world is also a very specific aspect of consciousness and therefore Descartes' distinction of consciousness into thinking things and non-thinking things is nonsense. Thinking things can only learn to think by having touching and handling and learning about things by training and culture. So the genetic as well as the cultural aspects of consciousness are now being taken into account. And because you are born as Indians, you have picked up some things which you wouldn't have picked up if you were Americans or Germans. Your culture has contributed to the structure of your mind itself. Your religion contributes to the shaping of your mind. The mind is not 
independent of the world. The mind grows on a material base, which is called the brain, and grows by interacting with the world and not independently of it. There is a false thinking that the mind is developed best when you put all things away, material, no good, only spiritual, which means throwing away all the material is the spiritual. That's nonsense. Your real growth in spirit takes place only when you know how to deal with the human beings, how to deal with things and you deal with them in the right way. So the material world is an essential part of your mind growing. Mind is not independent of the material world. He said the material world does not exist without depending on our mind. But our mind is not independent of the material world either. This is very important. That the mind learning, how did you, how did human beings get this big brain? Because at some time, according to the theory of evolution, instead of four legs, you had two. What happened? Before that, your head was always bound towards the world, smelling out food, gathering food, eating food, that was what your head was for. Once you could stand on your two feet, and when you had your four legs free, and they acquired some skills, then your brain also grew. The brain grew with the hand. The hand is an essential part of the brain. The human mind is not independent of the hand or the skin. So, this idea that spiritual and material are two different things, that consciousness, subjective world and objective world are two different things, is nonsense. The subjective, the world as it exists for us is a creation partly as a subjective mind. The mind as it now exists is creation partly of the objective, so-called objective world. Do you get that point? I think that is enough for this afternoon. You have become worn out. Now, hermeneutics is the process of trying to dig these things up. And there is no scientific methodology of digging these things up. But we draw from various sources insights. And gradually we have a slightly surer grasp of the nature of the world which is quite different from the old naive realism of science which claimed that it knows things as they are and that what is known can be written down in books and kept in libraries that knowledge is some kind of a commodity which you acquire put it down in books and keep it in your library no consciousness is a very dynamic growing reality always interacting with other things and in the process constantly growing. This is what was Gadamer called Wirkungsgeschichte, the history of the development of the human mind, of which so many parts are there. Uh, if you want to start, the theory of evolution says the original was a big bang. In that Big Bang, the potential of someone like me existing was already there, isn't it? Because it's out of that Big Bang that we have developed. And all the 17 billion years, according to them, of evolution is summarized in my consciousness. My consciousness is the result of 17 billion years of evolution of the cosmos. The astral evolution, biological history, astronomical history and various other histories. All together it is called Virkungsgeschichte. And one of the things that hermeneutics has done is to have a more sophisticated understanding of what the mind is and not presume like Kant did, hello, yes, 
അതെ അതെ എവിടുന്ന അതെ ആ അതെ ഹ്യൂമൻ മോണോറ്റാറിന്റെ സ്ലോ രണ്ടും കൂടെ ഉള്ളതുണ്ടോ ഈ ഇമ്മീഡിയറ്റ് ആക്ടിങ്ങും സ്ലോ ആക്ടിങ് കൂടെ കമ്പൈൻഡ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള അതല്ലേ മോണോറ്റാറിന്റെ അതെ അതിനകത്ത് രണ്ടും ഉണ്ടല്ലോ ഇമ്മീഡിയറ്റ് ആക്ഷനും കുറെ ഡിലേഡ് ആക്ഷനും ആ അതെന്നതാ അത് എനിക്കറിയാൻ പാടില്ല മോണോട്ടാട്ട് എന്നാ എന്റെ ഓർമ്മ ഫോർട്ടി യൂണിറ്റ്സ് രണ്ടെണ്ണത്തിന് തേക്ക് ഹൺഡ്രഡിന്റെ കൊടുത്ത് അയച്ചാട്ടെ ആ അത് എത്ര നാൾ ഫ്രിഡ്ജിന് പുറത്ത് വെക്കാനൊക്കെ എത്ര സമയം ഇപ്പം ആ അല്ല ഇപ്പൊ ഇവിടെ കടയിൽ നിന്ന് വാങ്ങിച്ചോടും വരെ കൊണ്ടിരുന്ന് കുഴപ്പമില്ല അങ്ങനെ ആട്ടെ ആ ആ മോണോട്ടാർഡ് കൊടുത്ത അയച്ചാട്ടെ എന്നാൽ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് കൊടുത്ത അയച്ചാട്ടെ താങ്ക് യു സോ യു സി മെൻ കാൻഡ് തോട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ദ ജർമ്മൻ മൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് ദി അഡൾട്ട് വാസ് ദി സ്റ്റാൻഡേർഡ് മൈൻഡ് ഫോർ എവറിബഡി നോട്ട് ദ ജർമ്മൻ മൈൻഡ് ഇസ് ദ ഇന്ത്യൻ മൈൻഡ് അത് നോട്ട് ദ സെയിം കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് മൈൻഡ് a different perceptions because of culture because of history because of language so many things have conditioned the mind mind is a very dynamic reality and mind has its own specificity as well as universality that is now recognized by hermeneutics so in hermeneutics when we we are try to understand what knowing really means and can we know that what we know is true no final guarantee no final guarantee you take a risk what is our religion our faith it's not because we can prove scientifically that jesus christ rose again from the dead and went to heaven sitting at the right hand of god the father you can't prove it scientifically but that is part of your knowledge and you accept that knowledge as your own and act on the basis of that but you can't ask for certainty before you act you cannot be sure that everything you know is absolutely true before you begin to act on the basis of that knowledge and the whole knowledge faith combination is such that we take risks because we are acting on the basis of what knowledge we have and of course we have the experience of other christians who have gone before us which gives us some guarantee but no scientific guarantee that the christian faith is the truth it's a judgment we have made not because everything has been properly told us or that because we have a scientific grasp on truth that's not the important thing the important thing is that the certain kinds of knowledge to which you give yourself and that knowledge take you over and it will guide you nourish you enrich you that is all that is possible the western quest for an objective certainty is foolish it's not available they are still going for that but it doesn't work they think they have it in science they don't because if you take any science textbook of 30 years ago and read it today it's all false all wrong knowledge isn't it a 30 year old science textbook is already full of mistakes isn't it so you can't say science is infallible science changes its views all the time and the idea that you can have a final infallible knowledge is abandoned in hermeneutics in hermeneutics we know that between the human consciousness and the world outside there is a two way traffic we contribute something to the world the world contributes something to us it's always existing in that situation and constantly moving this is what hermeneutics basically teaches us not to be positivistic about science not to look for a false sense of certainty okay you want to ask any questions i can give you a few more minutes before my next visitor comes and i'm very very tired but go ahead i can give you 10 or 15 minutes if you have any further questions to ask
ഈ പറഞ്ഞതൊക്കെ പരീക്ഷയ്ക്ക് എഴുതാനുള്ളതല്ല കേട്ടോ സെറാംപൂർ പരീക്ഷയ്ക്ക് എഴുതാൻ വേണ്ടി മാത്രമല്ല ഞാൻ പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് കാര്യങ്ങൾ കുറച്ചെങ്കിലുമൊക്കെ ഒന്ന് മനസ്സിലാകാൻ പറ്റി മനസ്സിലായിപ്പൂർ പേപ്പർ ഐ വിഷ് ദറ്റ് യു വുഡ് ബി മോർ ക്രിയേറ്റീവ് ഇൻ യുവർ ആൻസർ not repeat what i have said but uh, reflect for yourself try to understand some of these things just going through this does something to your mind even if you don't reproduce it even if your notes doesn't fully capture all that i think you should go through this process several times before i can get any work just had a consultation i just came from a major consultation on healing with uh, 10 different kinds of healing systems not only allopathy homeopathy ayurveda yoga naturopathy uh, pranic healing unani eh acupuncture acupressure uh massages uh high genki as a new japanese system jore another japanese system about 12 systems we not only talked about we actually practiced it in the consultation we had many people were asking me why do you want to be there for 6 days you want to have four or five papers why 6 days i said no 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 we are going to experience these healing systems And all these allopathic doctors who came with snoots saying no systems don't work all of them got treated the allopathy doctors got treated with other systems and they said there is something there i don't know how to explain it scientifically but something is working even pranic healing some of these medical doctors who came from the west they went through it and it uh, is powerfully transforming and that also is based on hello what but for the most important thing about that consultation was that they saw a new way reality is constituted all of the doctors there were 50 60 people all of them said our lives have been changed by this consultation because they saw also a different way of looking at reality itself not this limited science before that many of these doctors were wooden scientists saying only what which is proved by science can be used in healing then they saw that that which is not proved is just as effective or sometimes even more effective than that which is proved in science that was a great experience but also the most important part of healing is to know who i am in relation to the transcendent in relation to the community and in relation to the world all our sickness comes from problems in these relationships relationship to god relationship to human beings relationship to the world relationship to oneself that is all a great uh, experience anyway even the minister of health was converted Okay. As for Father George, but he's gone already, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey. When is the next class? I don't know. I've got so many things to do and not able to have the health to do all this. Don't even use both my hands.
diary of some kind sitting somewhere here? Can't find it. 1995 diary somewhere here. I used it this morning, so it must be here somewhere. Is it sitting there? No, I had it noted down when the next class is. That is it, yes. Next class. I don't know how the... You are second years. First years. What about the second years? When is their class? Today I cannot do any more. I am exhausted. I have got somebody coming to see me. Today is what? Third. Yeah. So what we will do from the next day onwards, uh, on Monday... I will start with the Methods of Theology course. Only for 3 till 4 o'clock or 4.15 because I have a lecture at 4.30. So, that will be for second years. Methods of Theology is for second years. Okay. That will be not for you. Then, the next day, Tuesday, I will have two hours for the two. One will be three o'clock hermeneutics, four o'clock methods. Three o'clock first years, four o'clock uh, Tuesday. Are you free? Four o'clock you're free. Four o'clock methodology, yes. And the same on the eighth. One hour for hermeneutics, three o'clock, four o'clock methods. And the same for the ninth. I hope I can finish in time to catch a train to Madras. What time does that train leave? Five. Five ten. Five ten. That means I can't go on till this long. Uh, I'll see. Probably it will be better for me if we don't have a methods course on Friday, on Thursday, because uh, I can't do it. Ninth also, I'll have only the hermeneutics course. Uh, I'll take it for you. Ah, that's all. After that I'm in Madras and by the time I come back you have your exams begin. When does your exam begin? The last week. Last week of March. Oh. So you still have some time uh, the week of the 13th? Or are you starting your... We are having our college exam. When do you have it? 14th. That's what I was taught. 15 to 16 I cannot do it because I am interviewing new students. So that will be about it now. Okay. Oh. Well, the most important thing is for you to write some assignments. But I am so tired, I have no time to read assignments because so many people are asking for me for articles, speeches, writings, papers, so many papers to write, and I'm just not able to cope with it all. Anyway, we'll do what we can by giving you a college test on this. Okay. Class <laughs> 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 <laughs>